This is Smart Investing with Mike Rand. Securities and advisory service offered through KMS Financial Services. This is Smart Investing with Michael J. Rand. With Michael's producer, Chris Martin. You can email us your questions. Go to smartinvestingshow.com to see how. For I have the pride, the privilege, nay, the pleasure of introducing to you the one, the only. This is Smart Investing with Mike Rand. Well, hello again, everybody. You are listening to the podcast of The Smart Investing Show, where we try to take the topic of investing. Number one, we try to get you good, relevant information on each and every show. Number two, we try to make it easier to understand. And three, we try to be entertaining. And a lot, I think that's probably where we'll fail most of the time is the entertaining portion. But not if Chris talks enough. If I've learned that if I have too many notes on my page... Chris will see that and get intimidated, and he won't speak enough. <laughs> I don't want to Isn't that right, you. Chris? I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah, well, if you interrupt me, there's another show. Okay. It's like, it's like with people when they when they get hungry, you'll get another hungry spell. Don't worry. Just wait. <laughs> you know how they some people take their eating so seriously. It's I'm hungry now. You know I want to get. Believe me, you'll have another time where you're hungry again. You know who you're looking at, right? Like, just look across the table. Do you think I I waste a a lunch or Chris? Look at me. <laughs> we don't we don't have cameras on us, so we look fairly normal. If there were cameras on us, <laughs> then they would people would say, "Gosh, those guys, maybe they want to eat less." <laughs> Using that word fairly, kind of loosely. <laughs> so anyway, on to uh, on today's podcast, I've got uh, tons of stuff to talk about. More than likely. I might be jumping through different issues here and I might be coming back to them on the next podcast because there's three issues, lots of stuff going on, lots of, lots of emotional content out there with all you listeners. After you got your December statements, that's a little bit of a segue into a super fearful memory that a lot of people have. So yeah, most people getting their December statements for you, Chris, just, it was kind of a butt puckering event for a lot of people. Okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't pleasant for a lot of folks, though it shouldn't affect them that way. So we're going to try to make people feel better. We're going to try to make them entertained. We're Yay. going to try to make them uh, educate. Actually, not educate, understanding. Uh-huh. So I'm actually, remember when on the radio when we would get two or three calls from the trailer parks in a row when I would tell people, <laughs> you know, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it to you. Well, uh-huh. this might be, we're going to try to understand it to you podcast. <laughs> we should change the name of the podcast now. <laughs> to what? The Understanding Helping. Podcast? Yeah. <laughs> the longest. Making you understand. <clears throat> yeah. Trying to get you to understand. Yeah, we'd have to have... We need that actor, Arlie Ermy, to do voiceovers for us. That's who we need. I, I You know, he I, adds... I think, a, I think he's dead. No, he, did he die? I, I think so. You can look at it on your phone. God, you I got a Chrome that. phone that looks like Kim Jong-un sent it to you. Look at that phone. Chrome. Huh? This is my son's phone. I had to the, take it from him. The Cosmo... You had to take it from him? Well, he, he bought himself a new oh, iPhone. Oh, oh. Okay, well, your son was kind of old. I thought to just be take. You're not behaving well. You need to give me your phone. <laughs> yeah, no, he could kill me. <clears throat> remember when we tall. remember on the air when we would do those voiceovers of Arlie Ermy? Do you still do them on oh, the podcast? See, yeah, uh, actor Arlie Ermy to be buried at Arlington. Oh, yeah. nice. So now who are we going to use? Chuck Norris. I don't think Chuck's coming to this podcast any times. I think we're too liberal for Chuck Norris. Yeah, I, what was that one joke that he was suing NBC that because, you know, he has trademarked his left and right legs as law and order, and he was <laughs> trading <laughs> He was uh, suing the show that they weren't doing anything like that. Look at that call coming in from that. Don't you think oh. that might be a uh, telemarketer? Oh, no, that seems legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, a lot of people have that many fives in their number. <laughs> yeah. So the podcast was just now getting a call from Saturn. Sweet. Yeah. We got, we're taking your calls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Randomly. What's the glooper doing in the market today? <laughs> yeah. So we'll start out with the story. So I met with some clients that I really, really like this week. Of course, it's kind of a busy time of year for them. And uh, 
so I met them at their house. So we're sitting in the living room talking about things. They had a super rough emotional year that I knew nothing about. And then when they started telling me, it's like, wow, I wish yeah. there's sometimes there's just not enough. Not, seems, there's not enough. Wow. Yeah. There's not enough good in the world to counteract the bad stuff that can happen to somebody. So I'm listening to this and they have a cat and it's a cat that's a different looking cat. And I, I found out, I asked them after all this happened, I said, what kind of a cat is that? It's an Abyssinian. So it's from northern, northern, northern Africa, Morocco, that type of area. We're close to the Med, and it's where Abyssinia is. And <laughs> I'm going to take the <clears throat> word for it. <laughs> so it looks like a little bit like an Egyptian cat, and this cat's all okay. gray with these bright green eyes while we're talking. And the cat comes up, and I'm animal friendly. Uh, animals typically, he jumps right up in my lap. So he, he snuggles down, and he's laying on my legs, and I start petting him. And I saw all of a sudden this vision of Dr. Evil comes <laughs> into my mind, and I had to stop and tell these clients. I said, you know, this is kind of funny. I'm talking about money while I'm slowly petting a cat on my lap. I feel like I'm a, a Bond villain in your house. So we all had a laugh. You know, the laughter was loud enough. The cat goes, hey, what the hell? And he jumps down and goes away. So... <laughs> Now I'm going to need $1 billion from you folks. <laughs> yeah. we shouldn't know. Wasn't it a million? And then Jim, he, you put your pinky up to your lip. <laughs> I felt like it because the cat looked exotic is what I'm saying. Not yeah. a long haired, but a short haired one. So it was, yeah. Yeah. My yep. friend's got one of those cats that's hairless. Yeah. It oh, that looks look... like they turned one inside out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's not a real cat. No, no, no. So on today's show, what, and probably, uh, Next week's show, what are we going to be talking about? Well, there's three main issues, um, maybe four, that are out there in the world. Issue number one is it's getting a little bit extreme now where people are saying that I'm either in the market or I'm not in the market. Or are you in the market? What do you think the market's doing? Have you met the market lately? Did you see what the market was wearing? Did you see what the market made for dinner? They're using this term, the market, too damn much. And it's it's done well, lost its meaning for sure, because we're talking general public trying to talk like the talking heads on CNBC. Neither of those two groups know what they're talking about most of the time. Or let's just say they never do. Yeah, let's no. let's be extreme on the show. Those two groups never know what they're talking about. We all know that person though <clears throat> that, that's trying to use lingo. Well, no, the problem is is when they're not trying to use lingo. It's so much now in the le- normal lexicon of the culture that it's just spewed out there, and nobody really knows what the hell it means. Yeah, okay. it encompasses too much. Right. Uh, another issue that is that I'm starting here, I think, because of the aging population most of the time and it is a lead in this is the best lead in line that my industry uses to try to sell you some piece of shit okay this is what they use uh, uh do you have do you have the right asset allocation for your age because you know you don't want to be taking too much risk as you get older really okay define that define any part of that sentence so it makes sense you can't, okay? It is a sales line. Years ago, when I was in college, I actually believed that my industry was using that line to try to do good because you're coming off the savings and loan debacle with Clinton in office. You're coming, you're coming, you know, they were coming off not a good spell. It was the market, uh, not the market, the industry back then used to try to sell the stocks of the day. It was transitioning from trying to give you the hot stock tip of the day and double your money in a half hour, transitioning to try to sell you mutual funds that I think in the beginning that they, that would actually be better. You know, it's kind of roughly around the whole when news went to 24 hours and they needed yeah. something to talk about? Before. It actually started oh, okay. before. We're talking this started back in the late 80s, but oh, it okay. really started leaping off the page when yeah, when the 24-hour news cycle. Did the 24-hour, I think the 24-hour news cycle started kind of when the Gulf first Gulf War. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that would have been after 
the Savings and Loan, Drexel Burnham Lambert, Michael Milken, all of these villains that used to be there 30 years ago. Well, now these villains run, you know, uh, run big charity funds. Oh, good. good. Yeah, they they I'm landed. Glad. Again, I'm glad they landed on glad their feet. Were, glad they were punished well. Yeah, glad they landed on their feet. Can't have anybody getting, you know, too beat up. So that that's... That that issue out there I want to talk about. The third one that I have written down, I kind of alluded to at the start of the show, is the the super memory of 2008 being accessed when some people look at their December statement. And by the super memory of 2008, what I mean by that is, is that when something traumatic happens to a human being and the traumatic, the traumatic word is subjective. What's traumatic for somebody else isn't going to be traumatic for this other person over here and vice versa. There's a group of folks of the population that when their statements go down, when in in regards to their money, it wakes up something in the mammalian animal caveman brain of them. And they start reacting like it's a life altering or life, uh, life in danger event, like something's trying to eat them. And I don't know why this happens. But when something creates anxiety in somebody, that's basically our, that's basically mother nature trying to make us behave in a way that we will survive. So the species survives. That's really helpful a thousand years ago. When you're investing and you're getting your statement, it's not helpful at all. So a lot of folks have created these super memories that were created by the releasing of hormones when they've going through a very anxiety filled time they get the statement who knows you i would think that there's it's probably there's probably two things they probably are already anxious about something in their life or they feel unsettled and then boom they get a statement that happens to be lower than they thought it catches them off guard there you go off the you go off the tracks and now somebody's actually feeling anxiety over a simple piece of paper oh, okay and a simple piece of paper that can have a lot of meaning, but still, it's it's not, you need to tell yourself an accurate story if you're going to have accurate emotions, and there you go. A lot of people don't, how can they tell themselves an accurate story when nobody's taught them how to think about money in the first place? It's, it's you know, it's a lose-lose situation. So that's the third issue out there, is trying to, trying to reassure folks, trying to powder that issue, trying to get trying to get the listener some sort of a piece of a tool, of a toolbox that maybe by luck that they might remember this very very narrowly focused podcast or dealing with us in the past and thinking, "Oh, you know, just that little spark that might save them that they gives them something else to think about besides fear and anxiety and being preyed upon by my industry, trying to sell you something to get rid of that fear instead of doing it yourself, instead of getting rid of that fear inside yourself straight away, you working on your own emotions, knowing who you are, because it's better to have, it's better to be solid inside yourself and be squared away rather than always having to act to these other events. And what I mean by that is, is if you are in the best mood of in the world and you get pulled over for a traffic ticket, it's not that big of a deal. You know, let's, let's just say you're on the, it depends on how much meth I have in the car at the time. (laughs) Yeah. Really wreck my day. Yeah. Or the, or the type of woman that's with you. Right. You know, if let's say you've met the love of your life or such like such an exciting partner they're with you. You happen to be accidentally speeding. You get pulled over. You're probably, no matter what happens, you're probably going to be in a good mood. And it's like, yeah, I wasn't looking. Write me the ticket if you want. Yeah, I was totally speeding. You're still in this, you know, in this nirvana. Yeah, nirvana mode of ha- being having a good day that even getting a ticket isn't, you know, you don't care. You, It's not that big of an event. But the event doesn't change. It's you that changes. Let's let's reverse it. Let's say that you lost your job two weeks ago and you're kind of rushing to a new interview and you get pulled over. Entirely different scenario. 
I am sure that they probably educate the policemen. Maybe not. They don't pay them tons, but maybe the state patrolmen. Maybe these guys are educated, men and women, as to that the drivers are going to be in different emotional states when they pull them over. So it's your emotional state that matters more than the event is what I'm getting at. Yeah. You know, it's mm-hmm. you know, if you're in a great mood and you get pulled over, it's not that big of a deal. If you're in a horrible mood or you're under stress and all that and you get pulled over, it's a big deal. So that piece of paper just depends on what day it hits you. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Or you know, unfortunately, it's the trigger when you're retired or when you're thinking about retiring, it's a different mode. You've been working your whole life, so it's a huge change and you've never been retired before. So it's uncertain. And you're going to be thinking about money, thinking about making sure that your health care is paid for, you know, trying to get your ducks in a row. You know, mo- I think it's natural that most people think, well, if I'm not working, I want to make sure that everything's paid off. So your brain is kind of in this, lo- in this, the wheels are turning in a certain level in your emotions a little bit quicker than normal. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. You know, you're, and all of a sudden, you get a statement that comes and it's lower than you want it to be or that you thought it would be. And it's like, what the hell? I've got to fix something here. This won't work. Well, those are, those are completely irrational responses. You don't, how could you know? You know what I mean? I'd like to meet these people. What? Well, because. That have the irrational responses? Well, when I'm in a. Talk to your neighbor. (laughs) I mean, it's everybody. When I'm in a bad mood and I would get that piece of paper, sure, there's just another layer on my crap sandwich. (laughs) But if I'm I'm in a good mood and I get that piece of paper, my first thought is, well, I was in a good mood. It could be. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, And I will get calls from people that literally. Here's their first sentence. Well, I'm sure you're getting a lot of calls, Mike. Oh. And I tell them, no, because I've had my phone off. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm smarter than that. I see who it is, and I don't answer. I know when they send out those statements. Don't you think that I'm actually, quote, unquote, gone for the day? You know, no, I'm I'm sitting here working like normal, but I'm not, you know, seriously. Um, Leave a message. Beep. (laughs) I'm screening my calls, and if you don't get called back, you're the one. So, <clears throat> no hablo inglés. So, yeah, I'm sure you're getting a lot of calls. Well, actually, no, Mr. and Mrs. So and so, I'm not. What? What? You're not getting a lot of calls right then. Right then, I know it's an emotional thing. Then I just from that sentence, I know nothing is about facts. Exactly. Then it's about emotions. So I try to put on my counselor hat as quickly as I can. Because, you know, saying something that, you know, even to you, the podcast listener, your statement's down. I know you're scared about it. So I'm going to try to reassure you and I'm going to try to figure out which path of reassurance you're wanting or is going to be the most effective. Sometimes it takes a little bit. The assistant, my assistant, her mom's a client. Her mom needed reassured this last Monday. You know, and it's like, you know, and it's like, so... You need some reassurance. Let's start. Well, yeah, I need some reassurance. And she, you know, I said, so you're panicking. Let's like unwind the panic and all that. And when you start talking that way, sometimes it makes people feel uncomfortable because they're expecting somebody to bring out pie charts, oh. you know, pictures. This is why you should be okay. Technically, this is what you should not worry about. Yeah. And that that's not effective. It's never worked. Investor behavior in the United States has never changed. So every it's kind of like the old Seinfeld show when you're talking to – remember that episode when Jerry says to George Costanza, if every impulse, first impulse that you've ever had is wrong – is uh, when he tells him that his first ideas are always wrong, so he should do the opposite. Oh, uh, okay. Remember that yeah. show? Well, George, if your first impulse is to lie about living in your parents' basement, then obviously the opposite is true. You should just tell the girl that you live in your parents' basement. I remember that one. Yeah, and it was hysterical because he started doing the opposite. I remember, you know, he got better. Yeah, he meets that girl in the diner and, hi, I'm George. 
I'm unemployed and I live in my parents' basement. And she turns and faces him, which is always a good thing. If a, you know, if a female turns to a male and she's facing him and not turning her shoulders or her hips away, she's she doesn't facing. have that thing of mace in her hand. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I enjoy a, that. I have a feeling that that's how a lot of men's, you know, dates end is with mace yeah. in the face. So anyway, she turns to him and says, "Well, hi, I'm Mary." You know, she yeah. instantly there's that connection. That just slayed me that episode. Episode. I thought it was so funny. And the reason it's funny is it's based on some emotional ara- realities that tend to be caricatures. And that's a fact. Look at investor behavior right now. Why would anybody in my industry want you to be a better investor? You wouldn't need them then. Why would CNBC want you to be less emotional and less anxiety provoked. They wouldn't. If you're not worried about anything, what the hell do you have? What's the reason to watch them? Right. There's no reason at all. When the market's up, 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 maybe there's a reason to watch when there's a little bit of euphoria, like going to the party. Hey, they have really good tequila here. I'm going to stay here a while longer. Maybe there's some sort of that feeling, but you know, when there's emotion going on, your people are searching for stuff. And like I said, look at the reactions, go on. Your, if you're listening to this show, you're obviously using a computer or a phone. So here's something fun to do, (laughs) fun in quotation marks. Go out there and Google the average annual return, I hate saying this, of the S&P 500 index for 100 years. Then try to do some investigation and try to find out, it's going to be a study, I forget who does the study, it's probably a couple different firms, the average return of an individual investor over the last 100 years. It could be the last 20, the last 10, the last 50. Doesn't matter. That sounds fun. Yeah, doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> Friday? Yeah, it's Friday. You're not working anyway. Put the solitaire down. Quit mind sweeping, and go out there and search this. So you're trying to compare... The average return of an index over a representative period of time, over a 20-year period, and then bring up what the average return of the average individual investor has done. And the numbers will be drastically different. Drastically. We're talking one-third or a quarter of the return. It won't even be half the return, okay? If you go a long enough time period... The average return of an individual investor compared to the returns of the general markets is like a third of what the markets are. Why is that? Because humans are emotional beings and flawed and because they panic out at the wrong time and then they buy in at the wrong time. This may sound way, way too simple, but this is in fact exactly, exactly What the hell happens? So you have a down market. Let's say the market, I don't think it, let's say the indexes are expected to go down, okay? And they continue to go down. And it becomes more of a severe downturn than we're currently feeling. You have people looking at that information and they start to panic. And they start to think, It telescopes all of these events that were in the future. All of a sudden, for some reason, they're right in front of their face, kind of like the windshield in an old VW Beetle. The windshield's right there. You can't even smoke a long cigarette. You'll have to cut it in half with scissors because it's right there in front of your face. And... This down, the down, the your statement going down, the the value in your portfolio going down. You're thinking, my God, and. You just want the pain to end, and for some reason, people start panicking and extrapolating that it's going to go down for forever. I don't know what the hell they think. They think a million things, but what something causes them to finally sell. I just can't take another day of this. It's like torture when nobody's laying a finger on them. Nothing bad has happened. We're talking pieces of paper or little pieces of information on the internet causing these people to make huge, huge decisions with their life. Huge. So they sell. Okay? The market goes, the indexes 
continue to go down for another two, three months, maybe a half a year, maybe even a year. It doesn't really matter. But they continue to go down. So that person feels better that they're not watching their statement go down anymore. And they've kind of patted themselves on the back as like, I've avoided all of this bad stuff that's continued to happen. I'm sure glad I did that. Um, I, I highly doubt he still <clears throat> listens to this podcast, but you and I know a certain guy who owned a store that I worked at. Oh, yeah. Um, that's uh, almost exactly why he sold everything. He couldn't take just all of the stress he all need, of the time, but it's all he, he focused on. He, needs, he needed psychological help. And, you know, usually when that sentence is said, somebody's doing something really strange or weird out right. there. You know, they're parking across from the elementary school with a van with candy in the yeah. back. No, he no this needed, isn't that. He just needed someone to just, well, well, you know, and that's why I told him to listen to this podcast. But then he he liked what you said, but he, can't he apply still it. had, yeah, he still had the paranoia of, no, no, I don't think they're telling me the truth. Right. Uh, he needed help. Yeah, truly. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and and but he he did feel better. But it's weird. He sold his stuff, but then he felt better. Because, oh, I sold out. But then he would watch the stock market still. Right. Even though he had no skin in the game anymore. Oh, look what these guys. Oh, those guys. I'm glad I sold it. Yeah. So let's go back to my person that they've sold out the their the investments that they had or the index continued to go down for a year. So they they felt good that they have avoided. That pain, number one, they're not feeling pain. They're feeling some sort of anxiety. Nobody's sticking them with a needle. Nobody's waterboarding them. Nobody's putting a match to your to your hand. You know what I mean? It's not true pain. Mm. That right there, it's not an, if you're saying yourself that I felt pain, that's not really an accurate story that you're telling yourself. You've got to go deeper than that. That's, that's kind of like an emotional cop-out. You know, or like when a couple breaks up, you know, oh, he hurt me. Well, or she hurt me. No, not really. You know, it's not really pain. It's something else that you're just labeling that, which you're telling yourself a wrong story. But I digress. So unless it's that one ex-girlfriend that stabbed me. (laughs) Right. She did cause me pain. I forget that times can be kind of rough out in Otis Orchard. They can be. (laughs) When I was going to break up with her, I was like, which shirt do I want to wear when she stabs me? That was kind (laughs) of... The one with chain mail in it, obviously. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I knew it because she worked a thresher. <clears throat> she always had a box cutter on her. God, Chris. <laughs> but, you know, you live in the valley, you learn. Yeah, exactly. Otis Orchard's not just the valley. That's a, yeah. like a subsect. I went there the next day and I saw that, you know, she drove her house someplace else. So I didn't know where I couldn't find her. <laughs> You're t- it's like the fundamentalist <laughs> part of the valley. <laughs> so anyway. Let's go back to this thing that we're obvious. This might take three shows. So somebody sold out. They feel great. Okay. Or they don't feel great because, you know, if they've sold out and they're in cash, they're not making right there. There's some part of their brain that's telling them, hey, they're not moving forward. They're just avoiding pain at the moment. Right. Okay. So a year goes by. Market's gone down a whole year, which is significant. Kind of. To a lot of people, extremely significant, okay? So the market, the indexes start to go back up. Investments start to go back up. And what do people say? Right after the first hour of things starting to get better, the news, the internet, friends, this is just a little bit. It's for sure going to go back down. It's bound to go up a little bit, but... It's just a little whimper, and it's going to continue to go down. You know, people will say, you never know when the real turn is. You never know when that point where things get worse from that point or things get better from that point. So things are starting to get better from this point, but the person that sold out, they're still skittish. There hasn't been anything that reassured their emotions over that year of the market going down. They have an event that was so painful that they sold out of, and they've avoided the pain of a further decline for 12 months. That's all that they have. They don't have any great emotional strength that, that's come from that. They don't have any reassurance that's come from that. It's a pretty skinny event. There's not a lot of feel good to it. So when things start getting better, do they react? No. 
They never react. I'm saying never. It never happens. Because they are second-guessing themselves. They're second-guessing the random movement of the stock market index that truly has random movement, where they're trying to see a pattern where they feel, how in the hell are they going to feel comfortable enough reinvesting their money when they, at first, all they can remember is feeling so bad that they had to sell out, and then they kind of felt good by not being an investor for a year Why stuff while stuff continued to go down for 12 months. Do you see the emotional picture that I'm trying to paint for you? It's pretty bleak for 99% of the people out there. This is the human condition when it comes to money and the stock market in that wonderful relationship. This is what it is. So they never, will use slang terms, get back in while things are depressed. They will only put their money back in when some little switch in their brain says, I'm going to wait till things get better. That's in quotation marks, but because Lord knows what, who the hell knows what get better means. So when things get better, another couple words, when things settle down, you know, whatever that means, all of these lovely little catchphrases that have no meaning, when this meaningless thing happens randomly, basically what they're saying at some random point in time, based on my emotions, if I'm a drinker, based on how much I've been drinking or not drinking, or based on my family life, there's going to be some cosmic conversion of events that makes me become an investor again. It reminds me of like when they tell you, I'm going to start a diet on Monday. I'm going to start a diet on January 1st. It's like you need a thing and it's like most every dietitian will tell you just just start today what yeah. are you doing just just do it today yeah you don't need an event yeah just and start small don't and, don't all of a sudden in the next 30 minutes think i'm never going to eat meat again you're going to miss it right <laughs> well and the guy trust that, me corn dogs you're going to miss them the guy that you're saying i just keep thinking well when the market calms down hey, let's not <clears throat> calm down enough maybe just a little more yeah maybe just a little more so remember, this is a long explanation of why the average investor's return is a third of that of the indexes. So it's why when, when they give this advice of saying just invest in the index, it ain't going to work because the person's going to panic out of anything that they do. So they have panicked out. They've avoided a year of downturn. Th- to use their words, things are getting better. So prices of these investments are starting to go back up. And they're continuing to go back up. A month goes by, two months goes by. Now, guess what? That person that sold out that felt pain before, now they're feeling the pain of greed that they're not getting. They're wondering, it's like, oh gosh, is this the time? Then they wait so long, then it's like, I've waited too long. The, these prices of investments that I used to own that went down for a year, now they've gone up nine months in a row. You know, they've almost gone up as long as they went down. So what am I doing? If I buy back in now, what am I going to do? I'm going to get three months of up market, of up, and then it's going to be in the same place in before that it went down again. I can't do that. Why would I put all my money at risk just to get three months of good returns? You see how the human being has put it in calendar months already? Things don't go on calendar months. The statements are printed to you on calendar months, but things aren't chopped up in a nice, easy 12 partitioned, 12 partitioned, you know, time distances of the market. It's like time is relative. Okay. And Investments don't care what month it is. So this person's already basing their timing on some on because the timing that doesn't matter. And they're not basing it on the value of anything. They're basing it on a calendar month. You get it? Mm-hmm. It's already really, really, really wrong, even more than in the beginning. So now they're thinking, oh, it's gone up nine months. And then you could put in a year and a half. The timing doesn't matter. They wait so long that their brain starts thinking, I've waited too long. I'm just going to put my money back in, and it's going to go down further. So they wait some more. Things continue to go up, and they are thinking, damn, 
I, and then they start thinking, then they start really beating up on themselves. If I would have just put my money in a year ago, uh, crap, I would have recovered it all by now. Now what do I do? And they finally, the same thing happens on the way down as on the way up. For s- some random event causes them to capitulate and buy back in after prices are already back to normal. So they sold at a discount, which you should never do. They sold under duress, which you should never do. And then they bought back in at a random time, all, probably at a higher point than they originally sold out. And this plays itself over and over and over and over again as long as a human being lives they never ever learn and i'm using the term never and it's true okay very 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 few people learn so that's why and in av- the that's why the if you search it on the internet that's why the average return of the average individual investor is a third or less or around about what the index is it would be bad even if it was just half but it's worse than that because they always will sell out at the wrong time and they will buy back in at the wrong time and all of this selling and buying i'll ask you chris what are they trying to avoid what i've lost all realm of i can't tell what they're doing i don't know I can't tell where they're going. Their their behavior is so random to me that I don't even know what they're trying to do. Do you? I think it just it goes back to the I don't know avoiding avoiding looking stupid. Maybe which yeah, I think yeah. causes pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or who knows? Because it's that it's that when the market goes down, they're always planning on the market going down, and when it does go down, they go ah oh, see see I knew it. Yeah, it's like they want to feel better. And smart about themselves, but they're just hurting themselves in the long run. Yeah, they're confusing themselves with the market. You're never going to know what the future is going to do, so why beat yourself up about it? It's unknowable. It's like buying a, a scratch ticket and going, I bet I lose. And then when you lose, ah, oh, see, I knew it. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, yeah, you're obvious. Let me count how many times you were dumb in that scenario. <clears throat> yeah, so, but you want to be nice to, you want to be nicer to yourself. You, the person listening to your podcast... You probably don't. You probably have a better handle on your emotions than everybody else because you've listened to now and you've listened to this entire podcast, which is what forty-five minutes or so. That's a lot. Most people give forty-five minutes attention to nothing, <laughs> unless it's a football game. So, so right there, when I'm trying to deal with a human being and they've done that, I don't even know where to start. Because I know they haven't a clue about themselves. And I know that if I just jump into the normal investment scenario, things are going to go wrong. And so that's why the average investor's return is so low. And that's why I think all of the advice that you get from my industry is not helpful. I'm not going to say that it's wrong. It's just not helpful because it hasn't changed anybody's behavior. The industry itself behaves that way because the industry itself is made up of humans. So it never gets better. How do you get better? How do you make that leap? Well, pretend that you own an espresso stand. Okay? There's a lot of them. I don't see them go broke that often. So they must make money. And they must be making easy enough money that the average person, after they make a few mistakes, figures out how to run it. Because if they were difficult to run, a lot of them would be going broke more quickly, don't you think? There'd be little sheds for sale everywhere. You're right. You know, I always call them, you know, the Russian mother-in-law apartment. You know, those little sheds. That's big enough to put somebody's mother-in-law in there. They could be kind of happy. <laughs> more of a unibomber shed <laughs> yeah tough shed that isn't a tough shed that that is a, an apartment for an in-law that is mm. what that <laughs> when they move into they go look at all this room <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's better than the closet i was living in what are we gonna do with all this space so this podcast we're almost done 
and I'm going to, I'm, we're not going to do two podcasts in a row just because I didn't plan for it. But the next podcast, I'm going to listen to this one and then we're going to pick up the next one again because that's what I guess I'm going to work back to front. I first have to try to figure out how to change the behavior of an average investor and it takes a while because it's a difficult thing to do. Obviously, it's not easy to change the behavior of a human because whether it's eating, whether it's gambling, whether it's some addiction to cigarettes or whatever, it's obviously hard to change the behavior. So changing the behavior on investing is going to be just as hard as anything else, maybe even harder. So anyway, that's it. Thanks for listening to this podcast of the Smart Investing Show. I'm Mike Wren. Uh, Chris Martin is across the table from me. What do you think you should do? Anything we need to tell him? Uh, just a reminder, if you want any more information about the show or about Mike or about me, go to smartinvestingshow.com. And also, it, that has all the links to YouTube, Facebook. So if you like the Facebook page, you'll get a little notification that I've put in a new show. So okay. that might help you. Okay. And I'll try to do together a website this year so somebody can look up and look at a bio and look at some of this stuff written down in print. So thanks again for listening. We'll be back again in probably a little bit less than a week's time. Any opinions expressed here are given in good faith and are subject to change without notice and are correct only on the stated date of issue. Past performance is not always indicative of future results. This material is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. Security financial instruments or strategies mentioned may not be suitable for all investors. Prices, values, or income from any investment mentioned in this report may fall against the interest of the investor and the investor may get back less than the amount invested. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs and is not intended as a recommendation of particular securities, financial instruments, or strategies to use. Before acting on any recommendation on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, if necessary, seek professional advice.